Can we give it up for all of our dads, the men who pour into us, who shape us? Um, man, I just want to say thank you. Happy Father's Day to my dad. Uh, he is worshiping over in Florence today. Happy Father's Day to my father-in-law. He's worshiping here with us. But happy Father's Day to all you men out there. Uh, we want to say thank you. Thank you for how you love us, how you point us to Jesus. Thank you for how you coach us and uh, you come down on us when we need it. Uh, we have a lot of great men in this church. So one more time, church family, can we say happy Father's Day to all the men in this congregation? You know, a lot of times on Father's Day, uh, and we've, we've noticed the, the disparity between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Mother's Day is, uh, moms, we love you, and we, this is just the greatest day ever. You're the most precious gift from the Lord, and it's awesome, as it should be. And then we get to Father's Day, and it's like, dads, really? Come on now. I, that, that is not what we want to be. As I thought about my life and how the Lord has raised me, Many of the men in this church have been used of the Lord to form me and to mold me and to shape me, to encourage me, to challenge me. So, man, I have nothing in my gratitude, uh, nothing in my heart but gratitude for all of you. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for all that you do. I hope you enjoy your day. How about how many of you guys enjoyed the bacon out there? Uh, can we thank God for bacon? Come on. I want to say a special thank you to all our cooks who got here er super early this morning. And it was hot outside. Anybody realize that it was hot out there? And they're standing over a grill. So that's a little bit different. So, men, thank you guys. Church family, can we say thank you to all the men that cooked our bacon? I want to say a special thank you to Brother Brian and Brother Cameron for all their work and setting up our car show this morning, our first ever car show. I thought that was a lot of fun. So uh, they, they worked hard all morning and in the, in the weeks prior planning this event. So I'm thankful uh, for those guys. And then what about this stage behind me? Uh, it's VBS time. Can you tell? This is awesome. I want to say thanks to uh, Natalie Gifford and Cameron Frost. Natalie, I believe it was Natalie painted all this. Cameron, am I right? Uh, sh and she's been painting this stuff for weeks. Uh, you just randomly go by the church on a, a random night, and you'd see her car out there in the gym, and she's working, painting away. Uh, so I'm thankful that we have people that use their gifts for the glory of God. And Natalie obviously has a gift for painting and creating. And then Cameron, yeah, give it up for Natalie. And Cameron puts it all together, makes it look good. I am so thankful uh, that we get to uh, serve the Lord together. So happy Father's Day. And uh, man, we are getting geared up, ready uh, tomorrow morning to kick off a week of VBS. And as Brother Blake shared, I ask you to pray with us. Pray that God would move. And on Wednesday, Wednesday morning is when we share the gospel. Uh, pray that uh, we would see many children place their faith in Jesus and start a life early of walking with Jesus and serving him. We got our first grade through sixth grade in here today. So first graders through sixth graders. How many of y'all are excited about VBS? Can I hear you shout in here? Y'all can shout in big church, all right? Uh, so they're going to be a little bit louder come tomorrow. Uh, it's going to get a little crazy in here. Uh, I am so excited this year. I'm reprising my role as Trip. Uh, that's what the kids will know me as. Trip is back, Trip and Harvey. Me and Brother Brian have been doing this for a long time. And uh, that's my one week that I just get to be myself completely. Just stupid. I'm just dumb. I, and, and, and I just enjoy uh, doing that. And so I'm so excited to, to, to get into that. But thank you guys uh, for your uh, prayers for us last week. Uh, I know you guys didn't miss us at all because, man, what an incredible message from Brother Blake last week. If you missed last week, man, you need to go back and watch it. I'm thankful for you, Brother Blake. A wonderful uh, message uh, that he brought last week. Um, but Brother Brian and I were at the Southern Baptist Convention. Just want to give you a little bit of um, a recap from that week. I know the news media outlets have their spin on things of what happened last week, but here's what I want to tell you. The Southern Baptist Convention is in, uh, in good shape. We are unified around the gospel. We are unified around the authority, the inerrancy, and the infallibility of Scripture. Um, I know there have been a lot of false uh, notions out there that the Southern Baptist Convention has gone woke, they've gone liberal, whatever kind of crazy words that you're going to say, and we're going to start ordaining women pastors and all that kind of stuff could not be farther from the truth. 
Uh, we stand on God's word that the office of pastor, elder, bishop is for men and for men alone. And so uh, we are moving forward in that direction. And so regardless of what you hear, so when you hear stuff from the news media outlets, just take it and trash it because that's probably what it is. Uh, our, 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 commi- our, our, co- our convention is focused about taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and from, from home, to, to, from here at home and to around uh, the globe. That's what we're focused on. That is why we partner together as the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Convention has no say in what we do here as a church body. Uh, we are a pastor-led church, staff-led church that we hear from God. And, and when God says do this, that's what we do. So the convention has no authority in our church. But what we do is we gather together. We partner together so that we can get the gospel to the ends of the earth. That is the sole purpose of the reason why we partner together as the Southern Baptist Convention. And let me tell you, we do it well. We commissioned 83 new missionaries to take the gospel to the ends of the earth last week. And I'm so thankful for that. That's the, that's the highlight of the convention. And here's the state of our world. Over half of them had to stand behind a screen and we could just see their silhouette because the places that they are going are, are too, uh, it's, it's unsafe for people to see their face and know that they're missionaries. Over half of the 83, uh, you couldn't see their faces. There were a few that you couldn't even hear their voices. Uh, that we ha- They would have a man and a woman that would share about where they're going and what they're doing because you couldn't hear their voice for concern that somebody could connect the two of where they're going. Um, our world needs Jesus. But let me tell you, church, uh, America needs Jesus as well. And so the North American Mission Board is planning churches like crazy all across the United States of America to reach our country, which is one of the most unreached countries now in the world. Not unengaged, uh, not unreached, because the gospel is prevalent throughout our country, and we still live in a free country. Can we thank God that the United States of America is still a free country, and we can come here and worship uh, freely? But we have a lot of lostness in our world, and it's time that the church be raised up, discipled up to take the gospel to our neighbors, to the people who haven't heard it yet. And yes, there are still people in our world, in our country, even in our state that has not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to be burdened about that, and we need to fix that. So I'm so thankful uh, for our convention. Um, Here's the the theme uh, that, that we saw woven all throughout our week. Um, that IMB puts out. So we have the Great Commission, right? We know that, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples. The one command of the Great Commission is to make disciples, which is why we talk about that a lot here at Clements. So you have the Great Commission, which is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And that Jesus promises us his presence as we obey him. And he said, and, and, and very truly, I will be with you even to the end of the age. So Jesus promises us his presence as we obey the Great Commission. So that's the Great Commission. And then you have later, you have John gets the revelation from Jesus himself of what the future is going to look like. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, you see the great multitude that around the throne of Jesus is people from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. And they are worshiping King Jesus around the throne. They're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's the worship service of the great multitude that is to come. But here's the thing. We're not there there yet because there are still people who have not heard the good news of the gospel. There are still languages and, and tongues that have not heard the good news of Jesus. And so it is our job as the church to partner together to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's, that's IMB's focus. And so between the great commission and the great multitude of Revelation 7, 9, we have the great pursuit, which is what we as a church family are on today. We are pursuing Jesus and we are pursuing those he died for. And let me tell you, he died for everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the pursuit that we are on as a church. That's why we do things like a car show to get somebody that maybe wouldn't get out of bed for just a a Sunday morning time, but they may come and hang out at a car show, eat some bacon. And then, oh yeah, I'll come hang out with you at church. And then they hear for the very first time, I want you to know God loves you. And they hear it, and, and, and the Holy Spirit uh, downloads that into their mind and in their heart, and they, they, it, they become aware. 
Wow, I know I've, I've messed up, but God loves me. That's why we do that. That's why uh, June 26th at, at Rogersville Park, that's a reach night. People may not come to church with you, but they'll go play bingo with you. They'll go play pickleball with you. They'll go play softball or kickball. They'll just go eat food at, with, at the food trucks. They will come hang out with you at a park where they may not come to a church service. The purpose for that is so we can reach people with the gospel. The purpose of this Thursday night, family night. So this week in this room, we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of children here hearing about Jesus all week long. Why do we do Thursday night? What is the sole purpose of having family night so we can reach those children's parents? The, the children are getting it all week. And so I encourage you, I challenge you as the body of Christ here at Clements, I mobilize you for a mission trip this Thursday night, 5.30 to 6.30 is our sensory friendly hour, 6.30 is for all families. I mobilize you, I deputize you, you can put the bullet in your pocket, Barney Fife, and you are on mission this Thursday night to go and reach the families of the children who will be here this week. That is your commission, that is your call. I challenge you this Thursday night to show up and, and here, here's just the easy way. Here's an easy way that you can be involved in the mission of Thursday night. You go to somebody you don't know and say, hey, what's your name? And you find out their name. Where are you from? And, you, th and then you're off to the races. Do you have a church home? Oh, you don't? Man, we would love to have you join us here. Man, we're just a family. We're passionate about, about Jesus, and we're passionate about telling others that he loves them. So, man, where are you at with Jesus? That's it. That's all you got to do. I just, I just trained all of you. All of you are now trained and equipped to come Thursday night and minister in the name of Jesus Christ so that we can reach people with the gospel. That's why we do these things, because we're on the great pursuit to see that multitude fulfilled in Revelation chapter 7, 9. There are people, groups that are not represented in that throne room yet. We got to reach them. We got to reach them. So, Southern Baptist Convention was great. We are unified around the gospel. We are unified around the scriptures. This Bible is our authority. If this Bible doesn't say it, we don't do it, all right? This Bible is our authority. And so as Southern Baptists, we are still uh, have a firm conviction that this is our authority. So thank you guys for praying for us. Well, uh, if you've got your Bibles, open them to Exodus chapter 20. We are in a series studying the book of Exodus. And it's been a, uh, a great journey. We've seen a lot of movement from the children of Israel in Egypt in bondage. God delivered them out of bondage uh, through the blood of uh, the firstborn of Egypt. At that point, Pharaoh said, get out of here, y'all go. They're delivered. They get out of bondage. They plunder the Egyptians. Pharaoh changes his mind, chases them down. They go through the Red Sea, and God takes care of the entire Egyptian army uh, by collapsing the Red Sea on top of them. They wander through the wilderness needing water, needing food, and God provides at every moment. And then chapter 19, last week, as Brother Blake led us, the Israelites come to the desert of Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula. We, now, let me, let, me, let me be clear. We don't exactly know where this is. Uh, we have, we have, there's two beliefs. Some are at the, that we believe that Mount Sinai is at the base of the Sinai Peninsula. That's the traditional belief. There are some that believe that Sinai is in Midian, in Saudi Arabia. And we don't know which one. Uh, there's just, there's, there's belief systems everywhere. And for somebody to say, this is exactly where they went, I think they're wrong because there's archeological evidence for both. And we really just don't know. We'll have to wait till we get to heaven and we can ask uh, Moses himself which route he took. But when the Israelites come to Mount Sinai, they don't move for the rest of Exodus. They stay right here. And so there's not a lot of movement but Brother Blake did a great job of just painting the picture of what happened as this God. So think about this. The, the, the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. And they are watching the Egyptians worship and serve their gods made of wood and stone. And they're doing all, they're watching this for 430 years. And then they are delivered by this God of the Hebrews. And so they are delivered, and now they're like, okay, well, this God has power. And if you remember in the 10 plagues, God was going against all the, the gods of Egypt. I mean, they served hundreds of gods, but I think there was like 27 or 29 like main gods of Egypt. And all the 10 plagues, God was showing the Israelites and the Egyptians and the whole world, hey, your God is nothing. I'm the one true God. 
so they worshiped the God of the Nile, and God went, he turned the, the Nile to blood, and that little g God of the Nile was powerless to do anything about it. Uh, so God was showing his power. He led them through the Red Sea on dry ground, and he took care of the Egyptian army. This is the power of God. But watch this. They've just seen the effects of his hand, but they've never seen him. They, they, they've seen the effects of the power of God, what God can do. But now they come to Sinai and God descends on top of Mount Sinai. And this holy, awesome sight struck fear in their hearts as the smoke and the thunder and the lightning and the fire comes on top of Mount Sinai. They are freaking out a little bit. And I don't know about you, but I would be too, all right? I, I would be freaking out if I saw that sight, this holy and majestic, awesome God coming down in his presence, put it on top of Mount Sinai. And they are getting a little scared. I loved uh, Blake's illustration last week of, of uh, the, the, the dried up leaf trying to reach the bottom of an incinerator. That is like us as sinful humans trying to approach God like a piece of tissue paper trying to reach the surface of the sun. As you get close, you just get di disintegrated. And so this is the, the, the holy and awesome and majestic God that we serve. And now he is made manifest in front of the Israelites. It's an awesome scene, right? This is absolutely incredible. So what I want to do is give you kind of an overview of the next several chapters, really the next 12 chapters. Because I want, to, I want you to look at the movement back and forth. Now, I'm going to go through these quickly. You can go back to the archives and kind of slow this down. Uh, you don't have to write this down. I'm going to go through this quickly. But I want, I want you to see the movement uh, of a lot of this. And just on, this, on a funny note, you got to know Moses was in shape, all right? Uh, and here's why I say that. I, between seven and nine times, Moses goes up and down the mountain. And this is not a small mountain. If you look at the traditional side of Mount Sinai, it's, it's, a, it's a long way up. All right, and he goes up and down like seven or nine times, uh, depending on uh, how, how you read some things. Se going up and down a mountain, like, I don't want to do that one time, all right? Uh, and he did it seven times. So I want to look at some of the movement that happens within these chapters. So the Israelites leave Rephidim and they get to the desert of Sinai and they camp in front of the mountain. They're not at the mountain yet. They just camp with the mountain in view. That's chapter 19, verse 2. Moses goes up to speak to the Lord in verse 3. And then in verse 7, he comes down to tell Israel all that God had said. Then in verse 8, and he goes back up to tell God what Israel had said. Here, this is what God said. Israel responds. And Moses goes back up to tell God what Israel said. And then God tells Moses some stuff. So Moses goes down in verse 14 of chapter 19 to consecrate the people. Then Israel moves camp to the foot of the mountain in chapter 19, verse 17. And then God spoke to Moses in front of the people. So Moses is with the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, and God is having a conversation with Moses in front of the millions of Israelites. Now, that's a cool moment right there. That's pretty awesome. All right? Then God calls Moses back up on Mount Sinai in chapter, in chapter 19, verse 20. Then Moses goes back down to warn the people not to come close. So he moves the Israelites to the foot of the mountain. Then he goes up. Then he goes back down and says, hey, Guys, don't come close to this mountain. Don't touch this. And this is that, that holiness that we see of God that if you get close, you're going to die. Now, you can, you can look at this verse of Scripture and say, well, man, isn't God just a, uh, isn't he a jerk? He, hey, don't you come close to me. You're not worthy, you lowly peasants, to come near me. You can't come near me or you're going to die. I'm going to kill you. That is not the heart of this Scripture. We serve the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So the same God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament. So as you see this verse, know that this is grace. This is grace. He's saying, I love you. I love you so much, and I desire a relationship with you. And as Brother Blake said last week, you're covered in sin. And if you were to come close to me in your state right now, you will die. Therefore, I'm asking you, don't come close. Please don't come close. So Moses, go tell them, don't come close. That's the heart of this scripture. It's grace. And then in chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, God speaks to Israel, the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know about you, but, it, but it, I haven't studied this in a long time. I, I think I've missed that. The Ten Commandments, when, when God shared that, he spoke it to the Israelites. 
in th- I, don't, I don't know how it happened, but we don't really know exactly. In thunder, in, in lightning, in, in, in the audible voice of God, God spoke to the Israelites and he told them the Ten Commandments. That is awesome. But notice what happens next. In, cha- in verse 19 of chapter 20, Israel asked Moses. They're freaking out. They're seeing the holiness of God with the fact that they are idolaters at heart, covered in sin, and they're freaking out. And so they say, hey, Moses, please, you go speak to him. Don't, don't, don't let God speak to us again. Would you go and you go talk to God and then you can come back and tell us what God said. Please don't let the Lord speak to us again. That's how scared they were. And Moses is like, guys, calm down, calm down. He is showing you the fear of God. That's a good thing. But he's, he don't want you to run off from him. He wants to be in relationship with you, but he wants you to understand his majesty, his grandeur, his power, his authority. He wants you to understand that. And he wants to be in relationship with you. And they're like, I don't care. Don't let him speak to us again. Just heartbreaking moment right here. So they ask Moses to be their mediator. Let me just parenthetically say this. Let's not repeat that mistake again. Please. Jesus has come. He's lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He has paid the price for my sin and for your sin so that through him, we can become the righteousness of God and we can enter into the presence of God ourselves, covered in the blood, not covered in my sin. We can be covered in the blood of Jesus and we stand before a holy God as holy people, righteous and pure because of what Jesus did, not because of what I did. Therefore, I can go before the Lord and I can hear from him. I can spend time with him myself. I can say, God is is, is teaching me this. Please, church, let's not replicate this this problem by coming to this building and sitting in this seat and asking me to become your mediator. That you come into this room so that you can hear a word from the Lord and then you can go and take that word and live. I'm telling you, you can hear a word from the Lord yourself as you, through Jesus, you enter into the presence of God. You open his holy word with the Holy Spirit will speak his words to you through this, this Bible. Open your Bible. You spend time with him. You say, Lord, what do you have to say to me? What do you have to speak into my life? Because listen, I am a man who desires to stand before you and bring you, thus says the Lord. But I'm telling you, you, if you are a believer in this room, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you and he can speak to you directly. I can't speak to all of your situations. I can't speak to what's going on in your life personally because I'm just a man saying for our church, for this body of believers, thus says the Lord. But for you, you can open your Bible and you can, you can go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and say, Lord, you speak to me and he will. So let's not replicate this problem here. Then in verse 21, Moses goes back to meet with God and to receive the civil law. The civil law start, starts in chapter 20, verse 21. And this, is, this civil law is where God is teaching Israel to become a nation. They got to have laws. When, when, when things go awry, they got to have ways to uh, uh, bring justice. And that is what the civil law is. Then Moses goes down and reports to Israel all that God had told him. And he wrote it down in the book of the covenant. That's chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. And then Moses leads Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders up the mountain, but leaves those men at a particular height. And Moses and Joshua go higher. And that is chapter 24, verses 9 and 13. And then at the end, Moses himself goes into the cloud and he stays 40 days and 40 nights. And he receives the ceremonial law of how you are to worship the Lord. And he gets the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on them where God wrote those commandments with his finger on those stones. Now, that's, that, that would have been an awesome piece of, uh, of stone to have that God wrote that. No, not, no man did that. God inscribed that law on those two stone tablets. And if you've read through uh, ahead of Exodus, you know that Moses ends up breaking those after the whole golden calf incident, but we'll get there in a couple years, I guess. Um, so that's kind of the overview that I want you to see. The people are, have now asked Moses to be their mediator. So you see, in Moses, the people were terrified to see God. And so Moses went up into the cloud. He had to stay in the clouds because he couldn't see God's face and live. 
That was what was true of Moses. But Jesus ascended through the clouds when he became our perfect sacrifice. He died on the cross in our place, was buried in a borrowed tomb, rose again from the dead three days later. And after uh, appearing to people over a 40-day period, he ascended into heaven and he didn't stay in the clouds. He went through the clouds right into the very throne room of God and he took his seat at the right hand of the Father. And so now Jesus went through the clouds into God's presence and now because of his blood, because of his victorious resurrection and our faith in him, our faith in the finished work of the cross of Christ, we now can enter into God's presence. I want to be a people of the presence. Listen, listen, listen again. I want to be a people of the presence. The number one mark of this church, I want to be God's presence is there. That's what I want. Listen, we are a people that love others. The love of Jesus overflows from us. Anybody here just want to testify that, hey man, I walked into the parking lot and I experienced the love of God by our hospitality team, by the people as they welcome. Anybody want to testify that that is, that is the testimony of our church that, man, when I walk on this ca campus, I feel the love of Jesus. Anybody want to testify to that right now? I'm so thankful that we are a body, that we are a church that loves people well. I'm so thankful for that. But I also want to be known as a people that, hey, God is at that place. If God is not here, I don't want to be here. If God's presence is here, his victorious presence that can save the lost, that can, that can give victory to the saved, that can free people from oppression, free people from chains of bondage in their life so that we can walk in victory. That's what I want to be known for as Clements Baptist Church. I want us to be a people of the presence. And we're not going to be a people of the presence collectively if, if we as individuals don't pursue him on our own. I want to pursue God's presence. I want to be used of the Lord wherever I go so that I can walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to be a people of the presence. Write this verse down, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. It says, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. And he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. But then he says, but how much more? Oh, church, I wanna live in the much more. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that, and here's the purpose, so that we may serve the living God church. We are saved to serve. We're not just saved to come fill a building and say, hey, praise the Lord, I'm saved. No, we're saved to take the good news that we received and to pass it on to somebody else who needs it. So we may serve the living God for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. We don't want Moses to be our mediator. We want Jesus to be our mediator. He's the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And so last week, Brother Blake gave us a great overview of the old covenant versus the new covenant. Under the old covenant, under the law, we become aware that we need a savior. We become aware that we are sinners and we fall short of God's perfect standard. And under the new covenant, Jesus has fulfilled that law so that in him, we can become the righteousness of God. That is the good news of the gospel. Eternal redemption is available to everyone who would trust in the cross of Christ. We can be like Jesus. We can be righteous in Christ, empowered by his spirit and loved by his father. That's what we can be. So now, that was the introduction. And so I, I need to confess some, something to you. Um, I was wanting to do that kind of as an overview uh, for us as we move throughout the book of Exodus. But towards the end of the week last week, God really began to change my heart as I, as I beheld the beauty and the majesty of God as revealed in the Ten Commandments. 
The Ten Commandments are God's nature, his heart revealed to the Israelites. And so he pumped the brakes on me uh, as, as, I was, as I was trying to just run off and, and I, I wanted to get back to movement. I mean, again, we're going to be at Sinai from chapter 19 to chapter 40, and then we'll get to Joshua as he takes the realm, the, the reins from Moses to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. But God pulled the reins back on me and says, this is what I want you to do. And so I'm going to obey him. All right. Uh, so we're going to begin this morning a kind of mini series in the Ten Commandments. I haven't even told our team that we're doing that, so I don't have a cool logo for you. I don't have a cool name because I got to get with those guys to help me, help me develop that kind of stuff. But that's just what the Lord did in my heart, and so we're going to begin this mini series studying the Ten Commandments. So how many brought your Bibles with you today? Hold them up if you got your Bibles with you. We love God's Word here. This is written by God. This is our authority. And so I always want to point you to the Word of God. Open them to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 3. Stand with me, if you will, in honor of the Lord and His Word. And we're going to read these three short verses. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words. And there it is. And I've got in my Bible circled God spoke. Just that amazing moment where God spoke these commandments. Here's what he said first. I am the Lord, your God. I, I just, I love that when he says, I am the Lord, your God. That's affirming. That's, that's, that's soothing to me. He is my Lord and he is my God. Question, question. Is he your Lord? Is he your God? That's a question for you. Uh, my day group and I were reading through first uh, Samuel right now. And as King Saul uh, is the first king of Israel, and he goes to Samuel a lot of times, and he would say, hey, Samuel, why don't you pray to the Lord your God? Oh, that is indicting right there, asking another man to pray to Jehovah, the Lord your God. He didn't say, let's pray to our God. He says, you need to pray to the Lord your God because he was not Saul's God. And, and we see that all throughout that. So, God says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. That crowning moment for the Old Testament when God delivered them out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's redemption. So don't miss the flow of this, this verse here, these verses. He said, I've already brought you out. I have redeemed you. I have called you my people. I've brought you near to myself. I've taken you out of the land of bondage, out of the land of slavery. That's redemption. And then the law comes. Verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't miss that flow. A lot of times we get that reversed and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We say, oh, well, no, no, I, I can't have, I gotta obey, you shall have no other gods before me in order to be the people of God, in order for me to become God's children. And that is not true. God redeemed them out of Egypt and then he gave them his law. And so it's very, very different here. And we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that here in just a moment. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would show us how much you love us through these commandments. They're not restricting, they're freeing. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, illuminate our minds to your goodness and grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So here's the thing I want to begin with as we start studying these 10 commandments. And it's, it, it's got such a bad rap, right? These 10 commandments have such a bad rap of, as far as commandments. Thou shalt not. It just seems like just so restrictive and, and like, oh, I can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, I can't do, can't do. That's what it feels like. But as we study these scriptures, my prayer is that we see the heart of God in these and here's the number one takeaway I want us to see as we go deep into the Ten Commandments. I want us to see that God desires a relationship with us. God desires a relationship with us. Listen, if you're here and you don't know the Lord, you've never repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus, that even as I'm speaking, there's uneasiness in your spirit because the Holy Spirit is tapping you on the shoulder saying, you don't belong to God. There's a form of godliness. Obviously, you're in a church. There's a form of godliness there. You do some religious stuff. You're not a bad dude. You're not a bad lady. But the truth is, 
You don't know God. If that's true of you, I, here's what I want you to hear loud and clear. God desires to have a relationship with you. The creator of the world desires to have a relationship with you. So look at, uh, flip over in chapter 20 to verse 21. Exodus chapter 20, verse 21. Watch this. This is after the people of Israel asked Moses to be their mediator. It says, the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The people remained at a distance, but Moses drew near. This is a reference to verse 1, of the fear of God. When God spoke, the people freaked out, and they asked Moses, now you go, you go speak to him. We don't want to do that. God desires a relationship with you. Please don't settle for trying to live vicariously through someone else's relationship with the Lord. It's you. You and you alone will stand before the king on judgment day. Nobody else will be standing there. I, as your pastor, will not have the opportunity to stand there with you and vouch for you. There will be no reference letters given in the court of the king when you stand before him in judgment. It's just you. And the one question is, do you have a relationship with him? Your daddy may have had a wonderful relationship with the Lord, may have been a godly man, and that's wonderful. Your mama may be a saint of a woman for putting up with you, and she may be the best thing in the world, but the truth is you alone are going to stand before the God, and your parents will not be able to be with you. Your granny will not be able to be with you as you stand before Jesus. The question on the table for you is, do you have a relationship with God? Psalm chapter 103, verse 7, write this verse down. The Bible says, he, that is God, made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Here's the takeaway. The Israelites knew about God, but Moses, he knew God. So when God would do something, the people of Israel would be like, well, I don't understand this. You know, I, here's what God did but his, his heart could be called into question. And Moses could be brought up and says, no, 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 no. I know his heart. This is, this is why he's doing this. I know his heart. There's a difference, church family, in knowing about God versus knowing God. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. That's how the Lord would speak to Moses. Now, obviously, we know that Moses did not, was not able to see the Lord's face. But this just gives you an idea of when the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting on top of Mount Sinai, he spoke to him as a friend. I love this statement by Robert Morris. You determine the depth of your relationship with God. That's so convicting, isn't it? You determine, not God. You determine the depth of your relationship with the Lord. How intimate is your relationship with the Father? How close are you to him? How quickly can you be pulled away from him? You determine the depth of your relationship with God. You see, these Ten Commandments, they're really not meant to restrict us. Can't do this, can't do this. Well, I... Ten Commandments is just a big killjoy. That's what that is. The Ten Commandments are not meant to restrict us. They're meant to free us. They are really just ten ways for us to deepen our relationship with God. I want us to go deeper in our relationship with the Lord. I want us to know him at a greater level than we do now. I want to know his heart. I want to know his heart for people. I want to have his burden for people. Is there anyone here that wants to go deeper with the Lord? Is there anyone here that wants to grow in intimacy with God? I know I do. But the challenging truth is that we are as close to God as we want to be. The invitation is open. The Lord is saying, come to me. And we can. We can draw near to God. And the Bible promises us in the book of James, he will draw near to us if we will just draw near. But listen, man. We are sinful people with this wicked flesh, 
And we are just caught up by every shiny thing that kind of glistens over here. We're just like, oh, well, hey, well, here's this thing over here. I'm going to go over this way. Hey, I'm going to follow this. And the Lord is just saying, come to me. Don't get caught up in the trappings of this world. Just pursue Jesus. He doesn't move. We do. if, If there's distance between us and God, I promise you this, it's my fault, not his. It's my fault, not his. So the heart of God as he shares his law with the Israelites is not, hey, obey these laws and I might bring you into my family. Rather, his heart is, since I have called you my own, since I have redeemed you out of bondage, obey these laws. Why? Because I love you and I want what's best for you. And these laws are what's best for you. We don't obey in order to be made right. We obey out of the overflow of our relationship with God because we are made right. Do you see the difference? I'm not obeying to be made right so that I can brag before God if I did this and I did this and I did this, therefore I'm good. I can't obey these. Every single one of the Ten Commandments I have broken. And you're like, did we bring in this wrong pastor? Uh Uh-huh. We've got a murderer and an adulterer and a thief standing on stage right now. I'm telling you, at the heart level, I've broken every single one of these. And here's the news flash: as humbly as I can say this, you have too. I don't have to know your story. I know you've broken every one. We are lawbreakers. We are sinners condemned by what we have done. I don't obey these in order to be made right. But God makes me right through Jesus, therefore I can obey these by the supernatural grace of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. He empowers me to obey them. I don't, I don't discipline myself and work myself up to where like, oh, I can obey these laws now because, man, I've been in church for a long time. I've been to Sunday school a long time, so now I got, some, I got some time behind me, and so therefore I can obey these in my own power, by my own flesh. That is not true. I need the supernatural grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. I die to myself and live to Christ, and he lives his life in me and through me. That's the only way that I can live a life that is honoring to God. Look at Exodus 20, verse two. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Outside in my Bible, right outside of that, I've got redemption. That is redemption. When God brought me out of Egypt, he brought me out of bondage. Anybody remember when God saved you, when he brought you out of, out of bondage and he freed you from the tyranny of the flesh, from the, the enslavement to sin? Do you remember that moment? Oh, what it was like to be free. To know that I stand forgiven. And I'm here to tell you today, if you're here and you've not experienced that, on this Father's Day in 2024, you can experience freedom. You can experience forgiveness today. And you can be made brand new. That's one of our our first core value. You can be made brand new in Jesus today. Today, on this Father's Day. And it would be a great day if you surrendered your life to the Lord today. So he's already delivered the Israelites out of bondage. And then, then, I got a line here after that. And the law starts then. Then he gives them his laws. So we're going to look at at just one commandment today. The first commandment where God says you should have no other gods. Look at verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. The first command. You shall have no other gods before me. See, this command is not that God should be number one in a long list of other gods that you worship and serve, but that there should be no other gods in his presence. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now that's not like, okay, well, I I, I better be first in line. Now I know there's some other people in behind me, you know, but, but I better be first. You know, that kind of crazy talk only works like on reality TV shows like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Okay, well, hey, you know, I, I've had 10, I think there's 10. But I've, I've had 10 other women, but girl, you my number one. I'm going to give you this rose. Uh, that's crazy. That's insane. Uh, I, can have, I can have the other nine, and I, I have the other nine, but you're my number one, girl. Yeah, I got you. You're my number one. That's insane. Uh, I have no idea why we're entertained by that, but oh, well, there you go. God is not saying, I just better be number one. No, God is saying, I better be the only one. 
You, that, that word before me is you just don't bring any other gods into my presence. You don't bring them before me. You, you all are standing physically before me right now. And so God is saying, I'm not just number one in your life. I am the only one in your life. The heart of this command is that we should find our ultimate fulfillment in God alone. We're called to worship only him. We're called to worship only him, give our allegiance only to him. So here's a takeaway for you this morning. You will worship something. We are made, created to worship. You will worship something. The question is, what will you worship? You see, worship is like breathing. You can't decide just to stop worshiping any more than you can decide just to stop breathing. Now, kids in here, don't try that right now, okay? Kids, don't try that. You can't just decide to stop breathing. Now, listen, if you're underwater, you can't just simply say, I'll stop breathing because I am underwater. Now you drown not when you stop breathing. You drown when you breathe in water. That's when you drown. So the question is not whether or not you will worship today. You will. The question is, will you worship what brings life or will you worship what brings death? If you worship anything other than God himself, that will bring death. So when life gets tough, you feel like you're drowning. Where do you turn? Do you turn to the Lord? Do you run to him and his word saying, Lord, life is really hard right now and I need your presence. I need your wisdom. Do you turn to the Lord or do you turn to a drink? Do you turn to a pill bottle? Do you turn to a shopping spree? Do you turn to a website? Where do you turn when things get tough. You see, only the Lord gives life. Only the Lord gives life. And so when life gets tough and the water line is rising in your life, if you turn to any other place other than the Lord, that only brings death. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things I will give to you. All these other things is what Jesus is talking about, your food, your clothing, the necessities of life. He says, you seek first the kingdom of God and I'll give you everything that you need, but seek first. What is your priority in life? See, sometimes we we get our priorities out of whack. Our priority becomes our job. So I've told you a a long time, if you've been come through our student ministry, I've told you for a really long time, There's a reason that Satan in his economy, in this world economy, he agrees to pay people twice as much on Sunday. I mean, you ever thought like, why not like twice as much as on Saturday? Like, I'm going to have to work and skip out on college football game day. I should get paid twice as much for that. He don't care about that. Satan says, no, no, no. Skip worship of the one true king and I'll pay you twice as much. And people are like, sweet, I'm in. Where's your priority? What do you worship? Some people worship people. They worship the praise and the applause of people. So it doesn't matter what is true, what is right, what is wrong. As long as people are applauding, that's what they're going to do. That's what they will follow. People can follow money. People can follow praise. People can follow power. I'll do whatever I have to in order to get that promotion, to get that level of authority so that I can be the boss. Doesn't matter what I have to do. Doesn't matter who I have to cheat. Doesn't matter how, who I have to lie about. I just need to get that power and I can get to that level. What is your priority? I love the example of the best fast food restaurant in the world, Chick-fil-A, in my opinion. That's my opinion, but your opinion can be wrong. Um, so Sundays are one of the highest grossing days for all fast food places. It's one of the highest grossing places. But when you look at the highest grossing fast food chains out there that are open on Sundays, Chick-fil-A will double or triple them and they close on Sundays. And they tell you why on they close on Sundays so that their people can go worship and God has blessed them over and above anything that they could have ever believed. And that they, they just said, we're not opening on Sundays. Now, if you try to open your own fast food joint and you're like, hey, I, I'm going to do this, all the, 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 the money heads are like, you have to be open on Sundays, man. That's going to be your biggest money day, I'm telling you. It's going to be great. 
And Chick-fil-A said, no, nah, we're not going to be open on Sundays. And God says, hey, watch this. And now he is just blessing them incredibly. And they're only open six days a week. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness. And God will give you all these other things as well. That's why this command is so loving, not restricting. It's so loving. God loves you so much that he wants the very best for you. And the very best thing for you, the very, very best thing for me is to worship God and God alone. Dad's got a question. Why do you give ki- your kids rules? Why do, you, why do you restrict them? I mean, kids, am I, am I right? When dad tells you no, hey, you know, it's, it, it's 10 o'clock. Can I have my fourth Rice Krispie treat? And dad says no. Why, dads? Come on. It's because you love your kids, right? That's why you have rules. That's why you tell them, hey, you know, look, you can't, you can't stay out past 1030. You can't stay out past 11, whatever rule you have for your teenagers. Or you can't leave the, the dinner table until I tell you you can leave the dinner table. There's rules that you have in place. But here's the thing about rules. The, when the, the rule is no longer in effect as the relationship progresses. So think about as a dad, when you have young children, you're like, hey, you can't get out of my eyesight. I I have to be able to see you can't get out of my eyesight. Why do you do that? Because you love them and you want to protect them. But as they grow and as they develop and mature and the relationship and the trust is there, you're like, hey, I can take my eyes off of you because our relationship is greater. When I was growing up, my dad had a rule uh, that, and again, I grew up in a time very different than the younger kids in the room. And those older than me, you probably grew up in a time different than me. But when I would get up as a kid, I would leave the house and I would not come back to the house outside of maybe come back for food. Or maybe I just went to a friend's house for food or drinks or whatever. And I wouldn't come back to the house as a seven, eight-year-old boy, 10-year-old boy. But the rule was I had to be home. We had a little street light uh, in our front yard. And when that light came on, I had to be home. That was just, that was our rule. Uh, now, obviously, that rule began to change as I became a teenager and uh, as I began to drive. Uh, then I got the, you know, hey, you got to be home by 10 every night. And then I negotiated and we went to, you know, had a table negotiations and I was offering this and this. And I was like, okay, well, you can have 1030 now. And I'm like, come on, man, I, I, give me 11 or whatever it is. Um, it, it began to grow. But that was my rule. Whenever the light came on, I had to be home. Uh, now there was no cell phones back then. And so whenever I wasn't home and knew I was in trouble, my mom would, mom or dad would be calling all the neighbors. Is Caleb over there? No, Caleb over there? No. They had, then they'd have to call the pirates deck down there on highway 43. If y'all are familiar with Green Hill, I lived in a subdivision off of, uh, highway 43. I didn't, you couldn't get to my subdivision from that main highway, but I lived, uh, in a subdivision back there, but pirates deck was on highway 43. And that's where I would hang out a lot. There was two good-looking girls that I'd like to go Mac on as my little nine-year-old self walking up to some teenage girls. Um, So we would always hang out there. And then she'd call Pirate Deck. Is Caleb and my best friend Christopher, are they down there? Yeah, they're down there. And they would send us home with two milkshakes. And we'd we'd walk back home. It was just a different time. You can't, don't send your kids out and just tell them not to come back until the light comes on. That's not a good idea in today's world. But as we grew... And as our relationship with our parents, they, they, they could trust us more, those limitations began to go away. So as we grow in our relationship with Jesus and we go from the old covenant to the new covenant, we move from, I can't have any other gods, that's the commandment, to now in Jesus, here's the heart. I don't want any other gods. I don't, I don't want these. I, I see the futility of these other gods. And so now, out of a relationship with God, his law is not restricting. His law is the most blessing thing in the world. I don't want any other gods but to bring before the Lord. I don't want that because I, want, I know that in God, I have life and I have life to the abundance. I want what he has to offer. So that's the good news that we have. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, write this. This is one verse parable that Jesus shares. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. 
Uh, J.D. Greer pointed out that, um, you know, Jesus uses some shady figures to, to tell his parables. That's a little bit shady, right? So imagine a guy's walking through somebody else's field, you know, stubs his toe on something and, you know, ah, he, he didn't have tennis shoes on. He had sandals. So he's stubbed his big toe, probably cussed a little bit and then asked for forgiveness. But then he, 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 he digs around. He's like, oh my goodness. I've found an incredible treasure here. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cover that back up. <laughs> but I'm not going to leave that corner out because I just stubbed my toe in it. I'm going to cover it all the way back up. And then going to slyly walk to the guy who owns the field. Hey, uh, let's think about buying your field. Oh, that old thing. Why you want that? <clears throat> no reason at all. Just, I like it. Uh, there's a cool tree out there. It's a pretty good tree. Uh, I really like to buy it. Ah, it's not for sale. Sorry, man. I, we're, not, we're not getting rid of that. I'll, I'll pay you a lot of money for it. Well, how much money are you talking? I don't care. Name your price. Okay, well, fine. That, that one acre is going to be $300,000. Done. Sold. Got it. Absolutely. I'm in. <laughs> Sweet. That guy just goes off. And then the Bible says he went and sold all he had and bought that field. But watch this. There's one thing that I just left out. In his joy, he forsook everything that he had to find that, to get that treasure, to obtain that treasure. Finding God is like that. It is pure joy and excitement to sell all that you have. There's nothing in this world that can compare to a relationship with God. That in his joy, he says, forsake everything in my life. You can have it all. I just want Jesus. I don't care what it costs me. You can have my job. You can have my house. You can have my cars that I got on display out there. I don't have one out there. But if you guys have one out there, you can have them. Everything I have, I will gladly give up. And in my joy, I get a relationship with God. That is what the kingdom of God is like. It is joy. So this first commandment is freeing. You shall have no other gods before me. God is saying, because the best thing for you is if you don't have any other gods before me. You see, the first commandment is really a covering over all the rest, all the other nine. If you get this right, if you get a relationship with God right, the rest will fall into place. For us in the new covenant, when we abide in Christ, when we allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives, if you're a believer, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God, but there is still a, a willful yielding of your life that you yield your life over to his control. When he says, do this, you do that. You yield control over to him and you allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. We begin to fulfill all the other laws supernaturally. We don't kill people. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God that lives inside of us, he created them in, his, their, in their mother's womb and he loves them so much that Jesus went to die for them. And so we are overtaken by the power of the Holy Spirit and our hearts are changed not to have hate and murder towards that person. We see them and we love them. Why do we love them? Because the Holy Spirit inside of us loves them. He created them to be in relationship with himself and sin has separated from them from him. And now we get to be a part. We get to be a part. Get to, get to, not got to. We get to be a part of what God is doing to redeem that person to himself to reconcile the lost. We get to be a part of that. How cool is that? I have nothing to do with that. If you get saved here today, I have nothing to do with that. That's all the Holy Spirit, all him, none me, but man, it's fun for me to get a front row seat. I just get to pop the popcorn, sit back and watch God work. Man, how cool is it to serve the Lord? It's awesome. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then Paul says, against such things, there is no law. You can't make a law to make you do any of these things. Love. I'm going to make a law that says you all have to love one another. You can't do that. There is no law against those things. There is no law against that. Referencing this verse of scripture, Tim Chester wrote this. 
In other words, the spirit grows in us virtues that cannot be created or even expressed by any law. You can't codify patience or kindness or goodness. Dads, you know this all too well that you can't create patience by a harsh command. Son, you should be patient. I demand it. I'm cooking a pizza, there's got 12 minutes left and you're gonna be patient while we wait on that pizza to get done. I demand you be patient. You can't do that. The best you can do is to make your child's impatience slightly less wearing on you. That's the best that you can do. You can't demand these things. The Holy Spirit can only develop these things in us. But as we pursue the Lord, the Holy Spirit develops our character to act in such a way that is honoring to God. That's why in that verse, Galatians 5.22, it says the fruit of the Spirit. One fruit, many different different, uh, manifestations of that one fruit. It's not fruits of the Spirit. That's not true. Don't say fruits of the spirit. It is the fruit of the spirit. One spirit, one fruit, the life of Christ in you and through you manifested in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Nine fruits of manifestation. Nine ways that that one fruit of the spirit manifests in your life. So Tim Chester says, it's not just about obeying individual laws. How many of you know that as parents, we know that's true, right? Hey, I need you to take the trash out. I'm watching TV right now. Really? Take the trash out right now. When you you start talking with your teeth together, it's about to get serious right now. Take the trash out. How many of you know that for them to obey you, you want their heart, you don't want their hands? Because how many of you guys are truly in your heart satisfied when they go by and just giving you that mean mug? <laughs> Yo, there, I did it. I took the trash. Are you, you happy now? How many of you parents would be really excited about that response? None at all. So Tim Chester says it's not about obeying individual laws. What drives true obedience, true obedience is a wholehearted allegiance to God. So let's go deeper. The first command is really encouragement for you to know God's heart at a, at a deeper level. Do you know God? Do you know him today? You can know him today. You can begin a relationship with him today if you don't know him. And if you do know him, I pray that you grow, grow deeper, that you go deeper with the Lord. As we examine these commandments, they're not restricting to us. They're really freeing to us. And I'm going to invite our worship team back up. So here's a question I have. Do you have a relationship with the Lord? Are your sins forgiven? Here's another question. Are you walking in close fellowship with the Lord? Do you have anything or anyone in your life that you worship more or give, or give more worth to than the Lord? Is there anything in your life that has taken place of God? I encourage you today, if that's true of you, repent. Turn from those idols because that's what they are. They're idols. And we'll talk about that next week. They're idols. Anything that takes the place of God in our life is an idol. Turn from it. Here's another question for you believer, for the believers in the room. Do you have joy in your relationship with the Lord? Is there joy or is it drudgery? In Psalm chapter 51, this is the prayer of David after he had committed the heinous acts with Bathsheba, with Uriah and murder of of Uriah. David repents and he turns to the Lord and he pens the words of Psalm 51 under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 12, he says this, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say restore to me my salvation. Because once Jesus has you, he can never lose you. Sin cannot overpower the God of the universe to pry his fingers off of your life. Sin is not that powerful to overpower our great God and remove us from his hand. When you get saved, you are eternally saved. You're so saved, it's ridiculous. But what can the enemy do to you, believer? He can impact your witness. How does he do that? He takes away your joy. 
And as me and Kathy and Chris were talking about this morning, just we had church out there on the cobblestone before y'all ever even got in here. You can't have your joy stolen. You give it away. Have you given your joy away by entertaining sin? Maybe your prayer needs to be, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I want to be joyful in Jesus again. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there anybody here today that would just say, I need to be saved? Would you just raise your hand right now? I just need to be saved. I've never been saved before. Amen. Amen. I've never been saved before, and I want to know forgiveness. I may not see you, but just raise your hand. Anybody else? I need to know Jesus. I want to experience forgiveness and redemption and grace. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. If you just raise your hand, look up here at me. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm going to have, I'm going to ask our deacons, if you will, to go to the back of the room. So our deacons, you guys can begin moving now. As we stand, people's going to be moving in and out. Just go find one of our deacons. You just tell them this, this one statement, I need to be saved. So if you want to be saved today, you just stand up right where you are. Begin moving out of the aisle. People will let you out. If you're in the middle of the aisle, you can stand up. Begin moving now. Begin moving now. Go find one of them and say, I need to be saved. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I need to be saved. For everybody else, you've said that you're either not ready to be saved yet. You said you're a believer. Is anybody would just say, Pastor, please pray for me. I want my joy back. There's just been things that have crept in my life that I've given my joy away. And my prayer today would be this, the prayer of King David. Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? I need my joy back. Amen. 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 Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for salvation in Jesus. That at least two precious people are getting redeemed today, having their sins forgiven. We praise you today. There's a party going on in heaven, and we will join that in just a moment to celebrate your goodness and grace. So thank you for that. But for every brother and sister in this room that needs their joy back, Father, I pray you would encourage them today. That you would give them the courage and the boldness to go to a brother or sister, go to a life group leader and say, would you please pray for me? Here's the exact situations that I'm walking through. I need my joy back. So Father, I pray that you would encourage them greatly in the name of Jesus. Father, we love you. I pray you would bless this time of invitation in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand?